Okay, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar sponsored by Alliance for Global Justice entitled Amazing Advances on Nicaragua's Caribbean Coast, Discrediting U.S. Media Attacks. We're honored to have Ambassador Francisco Campbell as a speaker today, as well as Nan McCurdy. I unfortunately have to tell you that Rick Sterling, who was making a great effort to join us from Syria, has been blocked from joining us because that country is not allowed to, to join, uh, apparently, webinars by Zoom. Uh, that's really too bad, but Rick did send his PowerPoint in advance, and so Nan is going to go ahead and, and present uh, instead of Rick. Uh, we look forward to audience participation uh, following all the speakers during the question and answer period. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be sent to all registrants within the next few days. My name is Barbara Larcom. I'll serve as your moderator. I am the coordinator of the Casa Baltimore Limay Friendship Project that links with San Juan de Limay, Nicaragua. Uh, before we begin, I have a number of announcements. Uh, David, could you turn to slide one? Yes. Let's see, I should put myself. Okay. Um, are people viewing slide one? Oh, great. Okay. So later today at seven o'clock Eastern time, there will be a viewing of the film entitled Nicaragua Against Empire. Um, and there will be an intro by the filmmaker and a panel discussion followed by viewing the film. The filmmaker, Ramiro Sebastian Funes, has documented a March 2021 delegation entitled Yes to Sovereignty, No to Sanctions. Uh, the delegation visited several regions of Nicaragua. You can register for the event at the bit.ly, which you'll see on your screen. Uh, it has its own little name, which is NICA versus Empire, N-I-C-A-V-S-E-M-P-I-R-E. -E. So you can register that way, or you can go to the live stream at uh, either of these channels that is listed here. You can also view the film at any time on YouTube by going to the bit.ly at the bottom of the screen, which is Nicaragua Against Empire. Okay, uh, to stay up to date with events and issues in Nicaragua, you can sign up for NICA Notes, which includes a weekly article by an invited author, followed by news updates of the week. Sign up at the Alliance for Global Justice website, afgj.org. Several eBooks about Nicaragua are also available at the same website, afgj.org. They're free in both English and Spanish, and they're downloadable in several formats. The eBooks cover topics such as the attempted coup of 2018, the events in Nicaragua in 2019, and uh, disinformation about Nicaragua and Nicaragua's indigenous peoples. Uh, slide two, please. We're also strongly urging you to contact your Congress member and your senators to tell them that you are opposed to the Rena Serre Act. Uh, this bill would impose punitive and coercive measures on Nicaragua in an attempt to influence the outcome of elections coming up in November. There is a lot of information at the AFGJ site uh, at the location at the bottom of your screen. Um, so that is an AFGJ.org page, which is entitled Urgent Tell Congress No Sanctions on Nicaragua. Okay, uh, slide three, please. If you would like to become more active, in opposing this terrible bill and US interference in Nicaragua more generally, here are two things that you can do. One is you can join our lobbying committee. Two is you can attend a special webinar uh, this Thursday, May 27th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and through both of these, you can learn more about the Reina Serre Act and how to organize lobbying in your area. If you would like more information about either of these ways of becoming active, please put your name and your email address in the Q&A down below. Or if you receive this later, 
you can email Jenny A at friendshipamericas.org. Okay, and we will con uh, we'll contact you promptly uh, once we hear from you. This webinar is part of a series occurring about once a month. Please mark your calendars for the following dates at the same time as today. I'm gonna uh, mention three dates and then each one of them is on a separate slide. June 20th, July 18th, and August 22nd. Each of these is on a Sunday and they're all at the same time as today. Okay, slide four. Oh, you're on slide four, okay. Uh, so June 20th uh, is entitled The Social and Economic Advances in Nicaragua. Uh, Colleen Littlejohn and Winnie Narvaez will describe the amazing advances in every walk of life since 2006 when the Sandinistas won the elections. And the description of the speakers can be found on the slide. I'm not gonna read all that um, in the interest of time. Slide five, please. Uh, so on July 18th, we'll be featuring uh, another webinar entitled U.S. Intervention in Nicaragua's Elections Since 1984. So this will cover the most blatant U.S. intervention in each election, and the speakers will be Chuck Kaufman and Nils McCune, um, addressing the U.S. funding of the opposition, the RAIN, R-A-I-N, U.S. Aid for International Development Destabilization Project, and uh, other activities. Slide six, please. Okay, um, on August 22nd, uh, the title will be What's at Stake in Nicaragua's 2021 Elections? And the speakers will be Sophia Clark and Saul Arana. And they'll address why this is such an important election, why the US has spent so much money and effort to try to keep the Sandinistas from winning and so forth. Okay, so we hope that you'll mark your calendars for all three of those events now and um, Zoom registration information will be sent out a little bit later on and it will also be featured on the AFTJ um, website. Okay, we are inviting organizational co-sponsors for future webinars such as these. And so if you're interested, please write a note in the the Q&A and we will follow up with you. Uh, the format for today's 75 minute webinar is the following. Nan McCurdy will cover some of the most important news items related to Nicaragua since our last webinar. And then each of the other speakers will have about 15 minutes for their presentations. And then we'll still have plenty of time for Q&A by the audience. Uh, if you have comments, please put those in the chat but please make sure that you put any questions intended for the panelists in the Q&A. I will be pulling those questions to address to the panelists later. Okay, now to introduce our first speaker, Nan McCurdy. Uh, Nan is the editor of the online weekly NICA Notes. She's a United Methodist missionary working in development in the countryside of Mexico. She lived in Nicaragua for over 30 years and she continues to have deep connections there. Please welcome Nan McCurdy. Thank you, Barbara. Hi, everyone. A lot happened over the last five weeks, uh, and I had to pick really just a few of the stories. On May 20th, the Ministry of the Interior, which is in charge of nonprofit organizations, summoned Cristiana Chamorro, director of the Violeta Barrios de Chamorro Foundation, to answer for their financial reports from 2015 to 19. The foundation has received millions from the US government, including 6 million from US Aid for International Development, USD, since 2015, to fund some 25 opposition media outlets who all played a major role during the 2018 coup attempt. They received 3.7 million just to influence this year's election. One of the recipients is the stridently anti-Sandinista and only newspaper in Nicaragua, La Prensa, where Chamorro is one of the directors. 
She closed the foundation in February, saying that she refused to comply with the foreign agents law, which requires nonprofits to account for foreign funds and their use. According to a ministry press statement, they found clear indications of money laundering. Chamorro is the daughter of former president Violeta Barrios and says she is a presidential candidate but no legal party has confirmed this. The new Supreme Electoral Council of six women and four men is headed by a woman. And along with gender equity, the magistrates represent different indigenous groups. Four of the 10 are from the Caribbean coast. One magistrate is part of the indigenous community of Sutiava Leon. Six magistrates are Sandinista. One has become a Sandinista sympathizer in recent years. One was proposed by the Conservative Party, one by the Liberal Party, and one by the PLEALN Party. The president, elected by the 10 magistrates themselves, is Brenda Rocha, who is from Bonanza, part of the North Caribbean Autonomous Region. She lost an arm in a contra attack in 1982 when she was 15. She is a lawyer and it just always brings tears to my eyes because I've known of her since the early 80s and to think she's now the head of this body is just amazing. Alba Nubia Baltadano lost both arms to a contact bomb in the insurrection in 1979. She is a lawyer and specializes in supporting people with disabilities. Even after losing her arms, she was part of the literacy campaign, coffee brigades, and the militia. Lumberto Campbell, who was the vice president of the previous CSE, was elected again. He is from Bluefields. Afro-Caribbean, he was in the insurrection against the Somoza dictatorship and is a highly recognized leader in many areas. And he happens to be the brother of Ambassador Francisco Campbell. Devoni McDavis is from the Mosquito Indigenous Group from Waspan, most recently president of the North Caribbean Regional Council and is a specialist in defense of indigenous rights. Leonzo Knight is from the indigenous group Ulwa, speaks six languages, is an educator and author, and was proposed by the Conservative Party. The FSLN Party registered its electoral alliance on May 10th, entitled United Nicaragua Triumphs. This alliance includes 10 parties and five movements. Since last November with the hurricanes, two hurricanes that hit the Caribbean coast, 26 schools have been rebuilt in the municipality of Bilwi. Through the zero usury program, nearly a million dollars in loans were recently made to 3,500 women in 90 municipalities. The Carlos Martinez Rivas Center for Open Innovation was inaugurated in April at the National Autonomous University in Managua. Students studying for different careers can develop projects and use the center, which is equipped with state-of-the-art computers, design computers, 3D printers, and other equipment. The thousandth home of the Bismarck Martinez Housing Project was inaugurated in Managua. 50,000 homes are planned around the country. Bismarck Martinez was a Managua municipal worker, kidnapped and brutally tortured by the opposition in 2018. His remains were found in May, 2019. National Assembly Deputy Walmaro Gutierrez said the almost 900 million in loans contracted in 2020 is a sign of the confidence of the international financial organizations in the country's economy. 
He highlighted the stability of the monetary credit and mortgage markets and said that the economy is expected to grow between 2.5 and 3.5% this year. The loans are for infrastructure, which generates employment and reduces poverty. He says, with all the challenges like the coup, the pandemic, and the hurricanes, Nicaragua has not failed to honor a single cent of indebtedness. Nadia Williams of San Francisco Veterans for Peace wrote against the new sanctions to California's new Senator, Alex Padilla. The new set of sanctions against Nicaragua is currently being reviewed in committees of the House and the Senate. It is called the Reina Serre Act. Williams wrote, how long is the punishment of the Nicaraguan people going to continue? Really, how long? I went there 37 years ago to volunteer on work brigades for a month while my husband took care of our three small children. I have US friends who live there and send long reports with the truth about the situation there and with detailed evidence of the lies perpetrated by the US government and the US media that back the right wing elite opposition. Will my country ever turn from imposing poverty, exploitation and brutal repression by our hand-picked dictators on the so-called third world? Are we still in the 1800s colonial and imperial times? Please everyone, take the time Call your senators, call your representative, and simply tell them, vote no on any sanctions against Nicaragua. Thank you. Nicaragua has the highest well-being in Central America, according to the 2020 Hanke Annual Misery Index, which calculates the well-being of countries. Honduras was found to have the most misery, closely followed by Panama and Costa Rica. The health ministry has given more than 237,500 doses of vaccines against coronavirus to patients over 55 or with serious chronic illnesses. Workers of institutions that serve the population have also been immunized. Vice President Murillo announced April 28 that 6.86 million vaccines against COVID will be acquired with a $100 million loan from the Central American Bank for Economic Integration. More than 1.35 million Nicaraguans were immunized against 16 diseases during the national vaccination campaign in the month of April. This included children, adolescents, and older adults. Vitamin A and parasite treatment were also applied. 10,000 health workers and more than 30,000 health volunteers carried out the campaign. According to a study conducted by the Spanish travel agency, Plantis, Nicaragua is one of the, one of the 10 safest countries to travel to in the world during the pandemic and is the only country listed in the Americas. The study used data from Oxford University and the World Health Organization. Thank you so much and I very much look forward to hearing Ambassador Campbell. Thank you, Nan. Uh, before I introduce uh, Ambassador Campbell, I'll just answer one of the questions that popped up in the Q&A, which is how many participants are there? At the moment, there are 83 of us online, uh, but since we will be also sending out the recording, I believe that other people will benefit from this webinar. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Francisco Campbell, who has been the Nicaraguan ambassador to the United States since 2010. Prior to that, he served as deputy to the Central American Parliament. He's an experienced diplomat and academic who previously served in Nicaragua's embassy in the early 1980s, followed by serving as Nicaragua's ambassador to Zimbabwe from 1986 to 1990. 
He's a founding member of the Foundation for Autonomy and Development of the Atlantic Coast of Nicaragua, uh, FADCANIC, the Center for Human C Civil and Autonomous Rights of the Nicaragua Caribbean Coast, SEDECA, and the University of the Autonomous Regions of the Nicaragua Caribbean Coast, Huracan, where he was the Vice Chancellor General from 1999 to 1996. Uh, please welcome Ambassador Francisco Campbell. Thank you very much. During the past 34 years, the Sandinista party and successive governments have been implementing a unique multi-ethnic, multicultural participatory democracy governance model in Nicaragua with gender equity based on the 1987 political constitution and the autonomy statute of the Caribbean coast approved in October of the same year. The origin of this novel approach to democratic governance is rooted in the ancestral and subsequent colonial history of the country, which was colonized by two European powers, Spain on the Pacific and Great Britain on the Caribbean. As a result of this different colonial experience, the population of the Pacific is mostly mestizo, Spanish speaking, predominantly Catholic and fully integrated into the Western conception of private property. Whereas on the Caribbean, the British colonial policy allowed for the survival of three indigenous groups, the Miskito, the Mayagnas and Rama, two of which were able to retain their languages as well as fundamental aspects of their culture, customs, and traditions. This policy led to the creation of a multi-ethnic, multicultural environment as two Afro-descendant peoples, the Creoles. In Nicaragua, that's a mixture of African and European stock. And later the Garifonas entered the mix. English became the predominant language on the Caribbean coast, along with Miskitu and Mayangna, and Protestant religious denominations, such as the Moravians, Anglicans, Baptists, and Adventists, acquired predominant influence in the region. Likewise, the primacy of communal property remained deeply ingrained among the indigenous populations and was also embraced by sectors of the Afro-descendant groups as well. These fundamental differences between the Caribbean region and Pacific were inherited by the Republic of Nicaragua upon independence from Spain in 1821 and remained intact for 73 years until 1894 when the Caribbean coast was forcibly annexed creating the Nicaragua known today with coastline on the Pacific Ocean to the west and the Caribbean Sea to the sea, to the east. Annexation also introduced a policy to promote what was labeled as reincorporation of the Mosquitia, which in practice was government promoted internal colonization of the Caribbean coast and its people. As a result of this policy, the Caribbean region entered a period of chronic and pervasive economic depression and social political alienation that extended from 1894 until the triumph of the Sandinista revolution on July 19, 1979. As was the case throughout the country, the Sandinista revolution inspired and generated great expectation that 
long held hopes and aspiration were now achievable. For the peoples of the Caribbean coast, this meant restoring aspects of the autonomy regime that existed before the 1894 annexation and subsequent depredation derived from the policy of internal colonization that ensued. This profoundly held aspiration of the peoples of the Caribbean coast initially was viewed with suspicion and encountered opposition from the revolutionary government, generating tensions that resulted in resistance and military confrontation that began to subside only when the government, after ample consultation with the peoples of the region, undertook to promulgate the autonomy statute of the Caribbean coast as an integral part of the 1987 constitution, which expressly enshrined that Nicaragua is a multi-ethnic and multicultural nation. Nicaragua became the first Latin American country to expressly do so. This autonomous regime in effect since 1990 provides for direct and effective participation of the indigenous and Afro-descendant population of the Nicaragua Caribbean coast in self-governance through a 45 member regional council in each of the two autonomous regions. These regional councils that comprise the autonomous government in coordination with municipal and territorial authorities and support of the several government in Managua are mandated to ensure full participation of indigenous and Afro-descendant population of the region, as well as mestizo residents in the socioeconomic development of the Caribbean coast through policies that ensure sustainable use of natural resources, integral human development through education, preservation of diverse cultural heritage, including traditional medicine, restoration and legal recognition of communal property rights, as well as incorporating traditional forms of impart imparting justice into the legal system of the country. This multi-ethnic, multicultural participatory democracy has brought amazing advances on the Nicaragua Caribbean coast over the last several years, and is the foundation for sustained economic growth and development are firmly being established, creating optimistic expectation for the future of the Caribbean region and the country as a whole. In the interest of time, I wish to highlight the main strategic accomplishment we believe are destined to drive the transformation of the river of the Nicaragua Caribbean coast. In the area of politics, number one, the Afro-descendant and indigenous populations of the region are empowered, guaranteed by law with equal participation of men and women at all levels of government. Two, regional political parties and civil society organizations are actively engaged in the defense and promotion of the autonomy process. Three, communal property rights to land are being fully recognized with titles already legalized and delivered to 23 indigenous and Afro-descendant territories representing 37,000 square kilometers. This is larger than the entire Republic, Republic of El Salvador. In the area of education, bilingual intercultural education is being implemented at all levels of the education system with indigenous and Afro-descendant students representing increasing rates of preschool, primary, and secondary enrollments. Second, two universities have been established 
on the Caribbean coast dedicated to the promotion and strengthening of the autonomy process. The University of the Autonomous Regions of the Nicaragua Caribbean Coast, Huracan, and the Bluefields Indian Caribbean University, Biku. Total enrollment at the two institutions stands approximately at 20,000 students attending classes on six campuses and technical institutes located in the major population center in each autonomous region. Prior to 1990, there was no university on the Nicaragua Caribbean coast. In the area of healthcare and food security. Healthcare has been a priority and now includes two fully equipped regional hospitals, eight health centers, 196 health posts, 25 maternal homes, 17 traditional and complementary medicine clinics, four pain clinics, and three social security clinics. With regard to food sovereignty and security, this has been achieved through programs that support small agricultural producers, cattle ranchers, and the fishery sector. The Caribbean coast now accounts for 32% of the national cattle herd and has become the largest meat and milk and milk producer in the country. The region is also the largest seafood producer in Nicaragua. With respect to infrastructure, electricity coverage in the country will reach 99% by the end of this year. And the Caribbean coast is fully integrated into the national electricity grid, which is complemented by solar energy plants installed in isolated rural areas. Likewise, the building of a highway to the Caribbean coast has been a decades long unfulfilled aspiration and no is realized. Three years ago, the highway to Bluefields was, inaug was inaugurated. And last year, a highway to Pearl Lagoon passing through Kukra Hill was completed. By the end of this year, a paved road to El Tortuguero at the head of the Kuringwas River will also become operational. And the highway connecting the Pacific a northern part of the country to build with on the Caribbean coast is projected for inauguration by the end of next year. This overview is a reflection of the comprehensive integral approach to achieve sustainable development being implemented on the Nicaragua Caribbean coast. And we are, we are convinced the accomplishment so far are a clear indication that the region is firmly on track and headed towards the goal of a better and more prosperous life for the peoples of the Caribbean region and a united and fully reconciled Nicaragua. I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. And I thank you again for this opportunity to share with you the accomplishments obtained in Nicaragua over the last 13, 34 years, as we advance in the building of a multi-ethnic, multicultural particip participatory dem democracy in our country. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Ambassador, when we entitled this uh, webinar, Amazing Advances on the Caribbean Coast, we knew that there had been some amazing advances, but you have detailed a lot more of them than I even knew. It's really remarkable what's been happening in Nicaragua. It's just wonderful to see. Um, and I'm sure people, thank you. Uh, I'm sure people will have questions for you. Um, in fact, I see one more just popped up. 
Before we go to those, I think I will go ahead and ask Nan McCurdy to do the presentation that Rick Sterling sent us, which unfortunately he's not able to give himself. But let me just mention, Rick is the board president of San Francisco-based Task Force on the Americas. Uh, he's researched and written articles on Latin America, Palestine, Syria, and higher education. After a career as an engineer, he works full-time for progressive international causes now, and that's why he's in Syria. Um, okay, so Nan, uh, take it away. Okay. So this is Rick Sterling's presentation. And I think I'm learning a lot today and you will too by the fact that we spent about two hours with Rick trying to get him on. He's in, in Syria uh, accompanying the elections but I think also checking out the US sanctions against Syria. And we found out today one sanction is that people in Syria can't use Zoom, which is something that if anything affects the freedom of US citizens who can't be hearing from people in Syria, which I'm sure is really the, the reason why. So at the last minute, um, I was sent this PowerPoint presentation and I hope uh, I can to do it justice. So can you all see the screen? Yes, Nan. Okay, thank you. Anurada Mittal from the Oakland Institute said, the supply chain of beef from Nicaragua was anything but clean. The indigenous people are not losing their livelihoods, they're losing their lives. And journalist Nate Halverson said, indigenous lands are going to cattle ranchers. Cattle ranchers are expanding and killing and the killing continues. Lottie Cunningham said that is going to cause ethnocide. And as indigenous people, we are going to disappear. And Camilo Belli said, if they are saying that there are actions being taken, they are lying. These sensational comments were made in the US media in 2020. All the people making these ac accusations are funded by either the US government or by billionaire foundations. Lottie Cunningham, for example, and her NGO receives US State Department grants uh, from USAID, from NED, et cetera. So if you look at this, first look to the right. So where we saw the story that really got a lot of play, which conflict beef was on uh, the PBS news hour. And then it was on a number of other uh, newspapers and news media. Um, so the people who appeared or in those stories were one, Lottie Cunningham. This is her NGO, say who can. What I've come to see is that the vast majority of NGOs are like private property and someone lives off of it. That's how they get a car. They give jobs to their relatives. And uh, well, from what we've heard, that's kind of the situation with this organization. Uh, Oakland Institute, uh, definitely uh, has uh, had a relationship with Lottie Cunningham. The Center for Investiga Investigative Reporting, who, who apparently a lot of quote journalists are paid uh, by that center. And then the Aspen Institute where Camilo Belli is. So if you look a little further to the left at the top, top left, the US State Department, USAID, funds Lottie Cunningham's NGO. The Howard G. Buffett Foundation funds uh, the Oakland Institute to the 
tune of more than a quarter of a million dollars specifically for really this story for what they call um, land issues in Nicaragua. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funds the Center for Investigative Reporting and the Rockefeller, Ford and Gates Foundations all fund the Aspen Institute. The Council on Foreign Relations um, has a big effect on these foundations. It is ideal, uh, they're all ideologically influenced by the Council on Foreign Relationships, which is opposed to the Nicaraguan government. So you kind of, this is how it all works. This is just kind of for one case, but Boy, Rick, thank you. This just lays it out so clearly. And here you have Lottie Cunningham right here on the left, who is the head of the Sehudikan uh, Foundation on the North Atlantic coast with the ambassador, I think this is Sullivan, and then the heads of other NGOs. This shows uh, some of the funding that the Howard Buffett Foundation does. Now you can see right here, 237,000 for the land dispute project in Nicaragua. But Rick said, you can also see how many other grant recipients there are of US law enforcement along the border. Arizona Law Enforcement, Air Support, Sequoia Farm Foundation, there were some other, National Criminal Enforcement Association, Larimer County Sheriff's Office, Macon County Sheriff's Office, pretty disturbing. Now this is the front page of the book entitled Nicaragua's Indigenous Peoples Neocolonial Lies, Autonomous Reality. This book was written by Stephen Sefton, who lives in Nicaragua in Esteli. He went to the Caribbean coast after a lot of these stories came out uh, to try to interview leaders on the Caribbean coast. So he was there in November, really during the time of the hurricanes. And he interviewed, I can't remember the exact number, but at least 20 uh, indigenous leaders. So we don't have to just believe those accusations in the media. We have here actual interviews with indigenous leaders. Stephen's book, by the way, is available online for free at afgj.org. So Aricio and Aloy are leaders of the Mayagna indigenous people. And you have uh, Stephen asks, how did the colonization of indigenous lands begin in the current era? Aricio Genaro Celso says, Arnoldo Aleman, who was president from 97 to 2002, was the one who started and promoted the issue of what we call colonization by mestizos of the Caribbean. Mestizos, if anybody doesn't know, are the people who live on the Pacific side of Nicaragua. They're the majority in Nicaragua and are basically a cross between indigenous and Spanish. So the colonization uh, and the support by President Aleman was with the purpose of destabilizing the whole autonomy project which was being developed at the time. The liberals led by Aleman wanted a strategy to disappear the autom autonomy project in the Caribbean to invade the Caribbean coast with a mestizo population. The situation is complicated because some mestizo farmers purchased the land. How did this happen? Eloy Gomez says, Yatama indigenous opposition party mayors and deputies were involved in the sale of indigenous lands. The community members didn't know. The mestizos came in big numbers, families after families 
entering indigenous territories, for example, in the area of the Rio Coco. In certain areas of our communities in the Bosawas Reserve, which borders with Mosquito Land, many Mestizo settlers came to enter our Mayagna lands. But how? Through these sales authorized by politicians from Yatama. How are relations between the indigenous leaders and the Nicaraguan government currently? Aricio Salsa. Before there was no consultation, the decisions weren't taken by the indigenous communities. Now things are different, progress has been made. Why? Because the government authorized the creation of a body within the courts, the Defenders of Indigenous Peoples was created. And the other important element we have achieved is that our indigenous officials hold positions in the courts so now the recent appointments of the defenders of indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples are indigenous people who speak the indigenous language. That is the other element which for us is vital. Are cattle being raised for export in the autonomous zones? Aricio Celso, in the lands that correspond to the area of the reserve where our territories are located, there is very little cattle ranching. It is on a minimal scale. In the Caribbean coast, there is cattle ranching, but more in areas that are not indigenous territories. But there is ranching on the Caribbean coast on private properties, where people from the Pacific have come to buy private property. And what they have done is perhaps double the rate of cattle ranching. This is Rose Cunningham Kain, mayor of West Palm president of the indigenous territorial government of Wangi Awala Kupia. She says, cattle here have been like pets in other countries. The people here supply the local market. We keep animals on a very small scale. So this report saying that settlers are killing us for land to raise cattle on is not true. Not one cattle rancher has died here. Not one mosquito involved in any kind of cattle related killing. It's a Disney World story, maybe a Mickey Mouse story, who knows. But it is not a real story of this municipality, Was Palm, or any of these municipalities where there are indigenous peoples. Lehan Moran, president of indigenous territorial government of Wonki Raya. I have seen the video that Lottie Cunningham released. She says every pound of meat that's sold to the United States is a drop of blood of the mosquitoes, which is totally false. I don't know what her objective is in spreading so many lies because it has nothing to do with anything real, nothing at all. These are things that are not right. I mean, a lie of such magnitude. Fresley Janes Mora, president of the Mosquito Indigenous Territorial Government, Tui Yavra. The problem of the invasion started after the year 2000. It was difficult for the communities. They didn't even have the authority to make decisions. From 2013 onwards, we have that dominion. So we now have the title, we have the dominion and the government, the state recognizes it. Sometimes outsiders are invading our property. So we have to teach them to recognize that they are our, that they are our lands and this land is not empty and unclaimed. It has an owner and the owner is the indigenous peoples. Therefore, although they do need land, they have to coordinate to reach an arrangement, to engage in dialogue, a negotiation with the owners. Sometimes we have a conflict, for example, with two, three of the 10 mestizos that are within our lands. Not all of them agree to recognize us. Always in everything, there are two, three families that do not agree, that do not want to recognize us. So what do we do? When this is the case, we visit the place and we go in a commission to explain to them the internal regulations of our communities or the internal regulations of the territory. If they agree, we can reach an understanding. We can sit down and start a dialogue, negotiate. 
because the lands cannot be sold. Even if I want to sell, I cannot. Even if I want to give them away, I cannot because that's a crime. But yes, the land can be leased. Ronald Whittingham Dennis, president of the indigenous and Afro-descendant territorial government, Karata. There are people who say remediation is to clear out, to get everyone out, but others say no. Remediation is to seek an understanding. To remediate is to reach an understanding. And part of that understanding is the well-known term of reordering. So what does it mean to reorder? It is not that the mestizos or outsiders that are within your territory are going to decide where they are going to be. You will tell them where they're going to be. That is reordering. It is a component for solving problems. The state provides accompaniment through the army and the army's ecological battalion. If a member of the community sold a certain portion of land for whatever reason, you are forced to sit down and negotiate so as to see what can be done. And to negotiate, you have to do so in a spirit of wanting to solve the problem. So you have to look for strategies on how you're going to resolve it. Because these people who have already come to live here for 14 or 15 years, they came to plant their crops. They have their own livestock. They have their animals. They're already well established. And that is what we in the territories have to understand. The damage is already done. What we have to look for is how to resolve the problem. There's news that spreads overseas that are examples of manipulated information and falsehoods that are not based on reality. I think no information internationally can truthfully say that in the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua and the Mosquito Afro-descendant Myagna indigenous peoples, there is a conflict. They just say that, but it is not the reality. Dr. Loida del Carmen Martinez Rodriguez, District Judge of Waspan, Rio Coco. The state has vindicated the indigenous and Afro-descendant people's rights to the land. And the state is also a guarantor in the efforts to secure social peace in our country and in our region. It is a process in which the state has guaranteed and has given the, those people this right. But the political opposition does not see this. They also say that the cases we have prosecuted are of little importance, but no, the indigenous peoples are being protected and the rights the indigenous peoples are being vindicated. And the state has contributed a great deal to this because no other government had ever recognized the indigenous peoples, giving them a title to what before was only private property where only the oligarchy and the bourgeoisie had the right to own land. We have prosecuted six cases of usurpation of communal domain of indigenous peoples where people are not natives of that community have come to misappropriate land of indigenous peoples. So how has this procedure been carried out? In the territories, <coughs> the owners of the land who are the presidents of the territorial governments file a complaint with the national police. The national police receives these and does all the investigative work. Then they refer the case to the public prosecutor's office and the public prosecutor's office files the accusation before the single local court. We have sentenced these people with the maximum penalty of three years and have thus sent them to the penitentiary in Managua or Matagalpa. Conclusion, numerous elected indigenous leaders say the Western reports of violence and export of conflict beef are false. They describe negotiation with settlers usually leading to resolution. Where that fails, the Nicaraguan legal system imposes penalties. Some NGOs and media are distorting the situation. Lesson, don't believe what you hear about Nicaragua and Western media. In reality, great advances are being made.
Thank you. Great job, Nan, of uh, handling somebody else's notes. That's because of your um, extensive experience and knowledge of Nicaragua over all these years. Okay, we have a number of questions that have come in already. And uh, we encourage other people, if you have questions, we have 13 minutes left in this webinar uh, to address some, such questions. So let's start. Um, first of all, Ambassador, is it a good idea for North Americans to be election observers in November at your elections? Well, the uh, Nicaragua Supreme Electoral Council will be uh, dealing with every aspect related to the organizing and how the, uh, how the elections will be carried out. Um, with respect to observers, um, I haven't heard any decisions as to how they plan to, how they plan to handle that question. But nevertheless, we can assure you that in Nicaragua, we are going to be organizing elections that are uh, fair, transparent, and most important of all, uh, respected by the Nicaraguan people. And that's the greatest uh, observation that can take place. Uh, everyone, please put your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat. Um, that will help me as I'm collecting the questions. Thank you. Um, okay. Ambassador, do you welcome Solidarity people to come to the embassy to visit? Oh, de definitely. The, the Nicaragua embassy is, is well known to be open uh, to any one of our friends who uh, want to visit us and um, it gives us an opportunity to answer their questions and to help them identify ways in which we can work towards what is the real uh, fundamental goal which is to build greater uh, uh, relationship between the Nicaraguan people and the people of the United States. I've always thought that the essence of solidarity is precisely that, how to build closer ties between the peoples of our two countries. Thank you. Um, Nan, here's a question you may be wanting to answer. What is the US profiting from its ongoing and relentless financial oppression of Nicaragua? I think more than anything, it's to make sure that there aren't more Nicaraguans. Nicaraguas. Make sure other countries don't follow Nicaragua's example. Once again, as we've said for years, it's the threat of a good example. They see it clearly. They don't like it because an example like Nicaragua would mean that more small countries would elect people from the people to do things with and for the people and US corporations would not be easily able to exploit. Uh, the local oligarchy would have their corruption um, cut. They wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, come, I mean, just think. Nicaragua is no richer today than it was those 17 years under three neoliberal governments. And they did nothing for their people. And these 14 years, it's just phenomenal what they've done with the resources. Why? Because there's not corruption now. So I'd say that's my answer, but I would bet the ambassador would um, have something to say about that question, Barbara. Well, I have always uh, said, going back to the 1980s, whenever uh, President Reagan would talk about Nicaragua being a threat, I always use the term, yes, Nicaragua is a threat of a good example. Other countries see in Nicaragua uh, the way that you can organize yourself in order to bring a greater uh, possibility of, um, of, of development and progress to benefit the peoples of the country. That is what the Sandinista government has been doing and will continue to do. And 
the, the opposition in Nicaragua, supported by the United States, seem to see that as a threat to their possibility of, uh, in the case of Nicaragua, ever returning to power. And so they are trying to do everything possible to undermine the progress that the Nicaraguan people have made under the Sandinista government. And of course, the Nicaraguan people will resist and will do everything to uh, retain that freedom to build the kind of Nicaragua that we all aspire to. I, I thought that you answered this question, Ambassador, but oh no, I guess you didn't fully answer. Uh, what languages are used for teaching at the universities on the Caribbean coast? You mentioned that it was bilingual, I think. Spanish, of course, but, you all, but also English and uh, Miskitu, as well as uh, Mayagna is also taught at the, at, from, in, the, uh, in the primary, secondary levels, as well as uh, at the university level. Great. Um, can you give us an update on the canal? Uh, what is the situation with the canal, if anything, now? I, um, I, have, I don't have any, um, any recent uh, information on that, other than the fact that um, well, I, I know that um, the uh, environmental uh, studies are, uh, are, are still um, underway, but beyond that, I don't, uh, I don't have any, uh, any, any, any more recent information. Sure. Um, what has, can you uh, mention a little more about what has been done recently to help with hurricane damage in general? And then there's a specific reference to Wawa Bar. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Place. <Right. laughs> well, it's a bar. A lot of, um, a, a lot of assistance is being uh, channeled to the, uh, to the uh, regions of the Caribbean coast that were uh, affected by hurricanes Iota and Eta in, uh, in November of, la of last year. And I imagine they are referring to the, the mouth of the Wawa River, um, where, which was impacted uh, by, the, by the hurricane. But uh, beyond the, um, the, uh, um, the uh, recovery um, activity that's going on, uh, to alleviate the effect of the um, of the hurricanes, I I mentioned the, the road the road to um, to uh, to Bilwi. and one of the major uh, construction work that has to take place is a bridge over the Wawa River. That's a, a major a major bridge that has to be built in order to complete. The connection of the um, of the Pacific side of Nicaragua with Bilwi and in the Northern Caribbean region, and so there are, are, are a, a, a number of uh, very important uh, uh, development activities is 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 taking place and will no doubt have its effect on those communities downriver of the Wawa uh, down the Wawa River that were impacted by the by the hurricane last year. Um, another question is, can we also have some more information on further infrastructure improvements planned for the Caribbean coast? Uh, and there's reference to possibly building a much larger harbor in Bluefields. Is that going to happen? And what effect will it have on the economy locally and nationally? It's going to have a tremendous impact. And yes, the 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 the, the studies are underway. It's been done by a Dutch company, if I'm not mistaken, to develop a deep water port south of Bluefields on the Nicaragua Caribbean coast. When completed, that port will have a tremendous impact on the Nicaragua economy as the exporters from Nicaragua to the, to the eastern part of the United States, to the Caribbean, to, to Europe, as well as to the eastern side of, of, of South America, 
will be open for the first time in the history of Nicaragua. As of now, for the Nicaragua exporters to, to export to the Eastern part of the United States or to Europe in large quantities, they have to use either a port in Puerto, in, in, in Honduras called Puerto Cortes or a port in Costa Rica at Limón. That has been a serious disadvantage for Nicaragua exporters. But now that we are in the process of building this deep water port on the eastern side of Nicaragua and the Caribbean coast, all of a sudden, our exporters will be closer to the possibility of getting their products to the market. So it's going to have a fundamental transformation, not only on the Caribbean coast, but in Nicaragua as a whole, and will have a great impact on the economy overall. Great. How bad is the problem of illegal logging in the Caribbean coast and areas on the eastern part of the country? And what mechanisms does the government have in place to control this? The government has a, what we call an eco ecological battalion uh, in the army. It was, it was referenced in, the, uh, in Stephen's uh, uh, presentation. They are out there fighting very hard against illegal, illegal logging. And uh, one, because it, the, of the impact that it has on the environment, and two, because of the, the uh, tremendous um, uh, involvement with organized crime in many ways. And so the, the government is actively involved. It is not easy. It's a very difficult challenge, but they are, they are making very important progress in that regard. If you take a look at Nick, Nika notes from, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, there was a big story of uh, some part of the government, I guess probably the military capturing uh, trucks and people and they will be processed, those people. Yeah, that's, that's correct. I, I saw that in, in, in uh, uh, it was a big, um, a big operation that uh, resulted in the, in the, in the capture and, and, no, and now they're being prosecuted uh, of uh, illegal loggers. But it's, that's a part of a, a, a organized crime ring that, um, that we, are, we are fighting at all levels. They are involved one way or another in Ill illegal drugs, illegal Im uh, migration and so on and so forth. So it, it's a big challenge that Nicaragua is, uh, is dealing with. And I would say uh, successfully, but it's a challenge that we have to, uh, it's something that we have to continue to fight. Uh, I have to say these questions are very good. Uh, compliments to uh, the attendees. Um, let's see, climate change impacts the Atlantic coast in a special way. What special in initiatives are being implemented to build resiliency? Are you receiving special financing through the Green Fund or other sources? Uh, Nicaragua as a whole is doing an outstanding job in dealing with the, uh, the issue of, uh, of climate change. And I want to point out one one uh, very important uh, 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 component in our successful effort. Nicaragua, some 70% of the energy produced in Nicaragua comes from renewable sources. Think about it, 70%. And by the year 2030, we are expecting to get up to 92% of the energy produced in the country coming from renewable sources. We are developing five uh, sources, hydroelectric, geothermal, wind, solar, and biomass. The implications of that are tremendous. It means that we are going to reach a point where our consumption of uh, uh, 
um, fuel, uh, fossil fuel will become minimal, very low. And there, therefore, our, uh, our impact on climate change will also be low. Nicaragua is a leader internationally in terms of the uh, uh, position we have adopted uh, with respect to steps to be taken to reduce the effects of on climate change. If you will remember in the, um, in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, United Nations conference on uh, uh, climate change, uh, Nicaragua was the country that insisted on the need to adopt stricter uh, enforcement measures to reduce uh, uh, carbon uh, emission. And so um, Nicaragua is, um, is, 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 a, is a leader across the board on the climate uh, change issue. Yes, um, Central America, our region is vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And that is why uh, Nicaragua has been adopting mitigating uh, steps across the board, especially in the, in the dry corridor area of the country. And so um, uh, whenever uh, anyone uh, wants to uh, refer to the issue of, uh, of climate change, Nicaragua is, is a place to, um, to, to, to visit, to see exactly what a small country has been able to accomplish because of a visionary uh, leadership. Um, and I want to mention uh, that we lost one of the most visionary leader that we had in that area, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Paul Okis. He was uh, recognized internationally as a leader on this, on this, on this issue. And so um, um, we can assure the world that we are going to continue in the, in the, in the direction uh, that Paul uh, 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 marked out um, uh, for Nicaragua as a constructive, positive uh, player in the world on the issue of climate change, which is the primary uh, concern at the international levels at this, at this moment. Uh, I'm aware at this point that we're running over our time. Uh, we still have several questions, very interesting looking questions left. So and I don't you know. still have 69 people. So I'd say just keep going, Barbara. Sounds wonderful people to me. People can leave if they have to. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, one question. Why do you think that the OAS, Organization of American States, was not interested in the elections in the United States, but it's over interested in the elections in Nicaragua. Well, um, I suppose that's something that um, that that should be brought up in the, in the uh, in the permanent council of the of the um, uh, of the organization of American states um, um, it would be interesting for those who are, go around the world saying that they are committed to uh, the preservation and protection of, uh, of democracy in all its manifestation, that they look into, look into what's, happening, um, what's happening in the United States. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not sure why um, uh, some of the countries in the, uh, in the Organization of American States haven't seen fit to, um, to look into this issue, but uh, I, I, I think it would be a good idea for them to uh, be consistent with their defense of uh, democracy and uh, uh, look into what's happening in this country, yes. Uh, this question from Scott Hageman of Columbia, Maryland. Uh, I've had ongoing worry that there is only one newspaper in Nicaragua and that it is run by a minority opposition with Chamorro. 
Where does it get its funding and who reads it? Of course, it is quoted by the US media as representing the majority of the population rather than a small minority. What are your thoughts? And do you want to, do you want to take sure. that? Sure. Um, well, obviously it gets money from the US, both overt and covert. Um, the US has been very tied in with the owners of that paper since the 80s, since the US war against Nicaragua. Um, I mean, they get a little bit from selling the paper, probably, you know, not a lot. They used to actually get a lot of money because they also have um, a major printing press. So they were able to bring in all the paper and not pay taxes because the news, I guess news media fall into a certain category, um, but it was really like cheating. So a couple of years ago, the, the, the law was changed. So they no longer can bring in the paper for their printing press and other things. They brought in tons of things. They brought in cars, they brought in yachts and basically just in the last couple of years has the government stopped all of that. So I'm not sure how they're surviving. They definitely get money from the US government, but you know, I'm not sure. Do you have other ideas on that, Ambassador? Um, I think you covered it all. Okay. Um, and so we, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll just have to see how, what they do to survive. Okay. Um, there's there's widely varying information floating around about the Nicaraguan government's response to COVID-19 and the impact of COVID-19 in Nicaragua today. Uh, any comments? Nicaragua has done an outstanding job in dealing with the, with the pandemic. And how do we know that Nicaragua has done an outstanding job? Well, it's relatively easy for those who want to see. The clinics and the hospitals in Nicaragua are not crowded. That tells you that the infection rate is not very high. And if it is in any way high, um, the people do not feel it necessary to go to the clinics or the hospitals. That is point one. Point two, death rate is not in any way significantly higher than was the case prior to the pandemic. In other words, we are not registering a excess deaths that could be associated with the pandemic. And that is, that is um, the, 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 the measure as to the success we have had. Now, how did we achieve success? This is something that a lot of people are not aware of or don't really appreciate. We have a model of a family, communal family oriented medicine that emphasizes prevention, emphasizes prevention. And when this pandemic hit, no one know, knew what the, um, what, how to handle it, no one knew of any cure. There were no vaccination. But what we in Nicaragua had, and which is our strength, is this model of communal oriented medicine uh, uh, approach that emphasizes prevention. And also in our country, there is an acceptance, acceptance of the notion 
of prevention, being prepared. Right now, for example, in other parts of the world, you are hearing people having problem with taking the vaccination. Well, now that we are receiving vaccination, there is no problem in Nicaragua because there is a culture of acceptance of vaccination. The Nicaraguan people say, you have a vaccination, I am ready for a vaccination. It is part of our preventive uh, uh, approach. And that is why with little resources, but with active involvement, and there I go, I go back to the importance of our participatory democratic model. The people are actively involved in the defense of their own interests across the board, be it in the fight against drug trafficking and organized crime, be it in the fight against uh, vaccination. The people are directly involved and that is why we are able to accomplish a lot with very little resources, financial resources. The involvement of the people is the key to the success of what we what we uh, what we take on to do in 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 Nicaragua, and that is why, as uh, Nan mentioned earlier, the the World Organization Health Organization, they said Nicaragua is among the top ten countries in the world where it is safe to safe to travel in the midst of this pandemic. Why? Because we have been able to deal with the pandemic in a very effective way. And I repeat, our hospitals are not overcrowded and there is no excess debt in Nicaragua. And that is the measure of our success. Uh, this may be a good time for me to, uh, to mention that uh, it's a great time to visit Nicaragua and we're even thinking of organizing some delegations before uh, Nicaragua's elections in November, maybe in September, October, or, or whatever. But either if you want to join a delegation or if you want to go on your own, this is a good time to go to Nicaragua because it's uh, pretty safe compared to many other places you could travel. Uh, and my understanding is you need to show a negative COVID test, um, PCR test, I think it's called, three days, uh, a minimum of, no, a maximum, a maximum of uh, three days, yeah, prior to arrival in the country, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and when, that, you're ready, then, and you know, when you're ready to leave, you also have to have, you have to present a test at the airport. Uh -huh. the mm -hmm. Okay. So that way you're not bringing anything in and you're not taking anything back with you. That is, that, that, that is why Nicaragua is a safe country to visit. We are serious in terms of all the obligations and the responsibility that we have in helping to, 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 to fight against this pandemic. And we will continue to make our, our contribution. Uh, the last question that I see is, um, can you discuss the circumstances of indigenous peoples who live outside the autonomous region. For example, for example, the Monong Monongnes in the Bocai River downstream of uh, San, San Jose de Bocai. How do they figure in autonomy? Saludos de Jeffrey McCrary. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's an issue that, um, that um, uh, have been um, on the table for, for quite some time because um, uh, to a large extent, the uh, autonomy process is, is, is territorial. And um, unfortunately, that, that area, even though it's populated by indigenous people, is outside of the, what's demarcated of, as the regional autonomous zones. But um, uh, we in the region, and I think the, the, the government as, as a whole would like to find a way in which uh, these indigenous people can also uh, participate in the, um, in the benefits derived from the development of the Nicaraguan uh, 
autonomy process and the Caribbean coast. But it's it's a challenge that has to be uh, has to be dealt with. Well, that exhausts all of the questions uh, that were uh, put to the, the speakers. I'm wondering, uh, does each of you have just some final comments you'd like to make before we, uh, we, we say goodbye to uh, these wonderful people that have hung in with us? Well, uh, just, just to say um, thanks very much for the interest in, uh, in Nicaragua. Um, we, um, we are making important progress. It's very important for us to, um, to continue to, um, to reach out to, to, to the American people. We believe that they have an important role to play in the building of a, of a respectful, mutual, mutually beneficial relationship between, between the two countries. Our, the Nicaragua government is committed to that objective. And uh, we hope that at some point, the American people will be able to persuade their authorities that it is in the interest of both countries that we work together in a constructive way, based on respect. You know, the only thing we ask of, of the American government is respect. We don't ask for anything else, respect. And we, of course, are prepared to give the United States and have always given the United States the respect that it deserves. Yeah, any final comments? I think just to remind people that if you would like to see the documentary Nicaragua versus Empire, uh, the registration link is in the Zoom near, kind of near the beginning at 2, 2.09. Um, and that should be fantastic. I've seen two interviews with the young man who made this documentary and, and they were really good. Thank you everyone for being with us today. I'm trying to, I'm trying to post it again right now, if I can, uh, in the chat, just the link to register. Oh, darn it. <laughs> Erica, if you're hearing me, can you put the registration link in the chat? Someone will, but if you, if you yeah. don't have it, give it give it a moment. And just many, many thanks. It's such a treat to have Ambassador Campbell here with us today. Um, he knows so much about so many things in relation to Nicaragua, but especially the, the Caribbean coast. Thank you very much and keep up the good work. Well, we yes. will definitely be inviting you again, so don't hide. Look forward and never hide. I always find you. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I did post the link to the, um, the thing in the, the bit.ly. If you see bit.ly, Nika versus Empire, that's it. Yeah, it's on there at 3.34. Yes. And many uh, thanks to David Archuleta, who works at Alliance for Global Justice and helps us with everything related to these webinars. Barbara and I definitely could not do it without him. And the Sundays we do this, he basically doesn't get a Sunday. So <laughs> he, thank you. He thank you. Definitely helped us today. <laughs> thank I you. Love it. it was a great presentation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to say goodbye now. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.